Good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you may be. Uh, I am Safwan Masri, Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Development at Columbia University, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this very, very special event, which I'll be introducing in a second. Columbia uh, operates nine global centers around the world, uh, one of which is in Amman, Jordan, which is where I am currently, and uh, these centers really serve as a platform for further connecting Columbia University's expertise with the world. And I'm delighted to have two of my colleagues from Columbia um, on this panel discussion today and to be reaching, to be reaching global audiences um, around the world. This event today is a part of um, a new book series called In Conversation With, which is a joint production with our partner, Columbia University Press. The series was launched to give our global audience an opportunity to listen to and engage with scholars and academics from a variety of perspectives as they discuss the latest, book, uh, latest books and research. Our partner, Columbia University Press, was founded in 1893 and is one of America's oldest university presses. It publishes, translates, and distributes books in an array of disciplines and professional programs. I also want to thank and acknowledge our partners for today's event, the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and the Globalization and World Cities Research Network. Cities of War, Global Insecurity and Urban Resilience um, is a book about the theme of cities as sites of contemporary warfare and insecurity. And I'm delighted that we have with us today Mary Caldor and Saskia Sassen, the two editors of the volume. This, there is no more jarring example of urban insecurity than the explosion that uh, took place in Beirut exactly a week ago. Uh, 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate stored in a warehouse at Beirut's port since 2014 exploded leaving over 200 people dead, many are still missing, and more than 7,000 have been injured. 300,000 inhabitants of Beirut were rendered homeless as a result of the explosion. The destruction of homes and businesses uh, took place up to six kilometers away from the site of the explosion, and the expected damage is in the billions of dollars. What really is also very, very sad about the events of Beirut last week is the, <clears throat> is the banality of the event. The fact that something like this happening in Lebanon um, is perhaps not very shocking. Before the explosion, Lebanon was already close to the breaking point. The lira had lost more than 80% of its value over the past year. Uh, mass demonstrations started taking place in the fall against chronic corruption and negligence by the state, power cuts, evaporation of life savings, job losses, families facing starvation are but a few of the symptoms of the problems that Lebanon has been having. Uh, with a very fragile health system, the recent resurgence of COVID-19 cases on top of the destruction of many hospitals as a result of the explosion last week, uh, makes the situation incredibly fragile. Urban insecurity is also a worldwide phenomenon and one that is likely to get worse in the com coming years. Our discussion today occurs against the backdrop of what is likely to be the greatest global economic downturn since the 1930s. As the COVID-19 crisis continues to unfold, the economic impact of the pandemic will exacerbate many of the underlying challenges that contribute to urban insecurity. In particular, this will be felt across the developing world in places like Beirut and the other cities that are referenced as case studies in this book, whether it is Ghouta in the suburbs of Damascus or Kabul or Baghdad. But these trends will also manifest in the developed world, albeit to a lesser degree, where rising inequality and political polarization give way to urban conflict and insecurity. To help us understand these issues, we have with us today, I'm delighted that Steve Call, Dean of the Columbia Journalism School since 2013, is joining us as moderator. Steve is the former president of the New America Foundation, 
He joined the New Yorker as a staff writer in 2005, and he continues to write for the publication on politics, national security, and the media. Steve is the author of eight nonfiction books, a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, prize winner, and a former reporter, foreign correspondent, and senior editor at the Washington Post. Steve's latest book, Directorate S, which was published in February of 2018, is a follow-up to his 2014 book, Ghost Wars. With us also is Mary Caldor, one of the two editors of the volume. She's professor of global governance and director of the Civil Society and Human Security Research Unit at the London School of Economics. Mary is co-editor of the Quest for Security, Protection Without Protectionism, and the Challenge for Global Governance. Uh, which was published by Columbia University Press in 2013 and co-authored with Joseph Stiglitz. Mary is also author of New and Old Wars, Organized Violence in a Global Era, and Global Security Cultures, among other works. Saskia Sassen is the Robert S. Lind Professor of Sociology and a member of the Committee for Global Thought at Columbia University. Saskia is the author of many books, including the wonderful book, Expulsions, Brutality, and Complexity in the Global Economy. Uh, the book is Sociology of Globalization and the Global City Strategic Site, a New Frontier. Thank you, Mary, Saskia, and Steve for being with us uh, this uh, evening, my time, uh, afternoon, your time. And thank you to our global audience for joining in. And thank you to Columbia University Press and our other partners for today's event. For audience members, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to uh, register any questions that you might have, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. With that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Steve, to moderate a conversation with Mary and Saskia. Thank you. So uh, yes, thank you, Safwan. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mary and Saskia, for uh, agreeing to this conversation, and I really look forward to it. Um, we'll talk together, the three of us, for a little while, and then we'll uh, turn it back to Safwan to involve the audience through their questions. Um, let me start, uh, Mary and Saskia, where your wonderful uh, uh, sort of academic travelogue, if I may, of a volume uh, begins, and also uh, where where it ends, which is in this marvelous image of the yogurt run in a benighted uh, suburb of Damascus. And from that, the idea that I want you to start out trying to define for our, uh, I'm sure, uh, sophisticated but general interest audience, this idea of urban capabilities that you're grappling with in the book, um, you don't mean power generation or uh, the ability to, to, to um, you know, carry out immunization programs. You mean something more informal and in some ways more profound, uh, but it's the, it's, it's the essence of what you're grappling with in this volume. So I wanted you just to use the yogurt run as an illustration, but go beyond that into um, some kind of introduction of what this idea of, of urban capabilities means to you as a researcher. So Mary, let me start with you. Well, it's, it's said that even in a moment of war, uh, cities will try to connect to each other, partly because they need each other. No city is an isolate, right? And so what struck us in this study was that in a situation of really a very bad type of war, very brutal, uh, somehow a connection appeared around this question of yogurt. And so I love that juxtaposition, war, cities that are suffering, etc., and yogurt. Mm -hmm. Yogurt as some sort of connective tissue. Clearly, it is the one example that we sort of went for. But there are many others. So when cities are at war, it's a different type of war from what we think more in the generic sense of war, of what a war is. So it, tell us exactly what the yogurt run is or was in southern Damascus. I suppose it's a version of trading across uh, enemy lines that we do see in right. conflicts, but there's a particularly kind of specific uh, vividness about this. 
Well, let me give you a couple of examples because I'm the person who provided the examples. <laughs> so the yogurt run, many people may have heard of Ghouta in eastern Damascus, which was under siege for most of the war and really witnessed the worst suffering of the war. It was where the chemical warfare attacks took place in 2013. And in Ghouta, there is a dairy farm which, produ which produces much of the milk products, particularly yogurt, for the whole of Damascus. So the dairy farmer made a deal with the government not to bomb his farm so that yogurt could continue to be provided to Damascus. And actually the dairy farm has become a sort of safe haven where refugees and displaced people, well, displaced people, they all are, uh, tend to come together. That's one example. I wanted to mention another example because at the moment they're the first responders on COVID-19 and that's a group called the people of Aleppo. And they're just a group of engineers actually who decided it was their job to keep the infrastructure going, to keep electricity, gas and oil uh, and water. And as it happened, the water was under the control of the um, uh, Islamist opposition. The oil was under the control of ISIS and the electricity was under the control of the government. So when they wanted to repair pipelines or whatever it is they wanted to do, they negotiated with all sides. And they're probably the only people who've negotiated with ISIS. And now, they are the people trying to organize a response to COVID-19 when there's no other response in the country. So those are two examples of what we call urban capabilities. And which also in that sense, you know, it's something that we don't think of when we talk about a place at war, we think war. But there are all these other complexities that really become visible when you, are, when you have a city. If it's just an army, it might be less visible. But when a city is involved, it sort of becomes visible. And it is, I think, to, to quite a few people, it's a surprise. It's not because somehow they didn't know it. It's just they didn't think about. You know, it was something that did not come into mind. So in that sense, this yogurt run became this marvelous example. There were other runs. <laughs> But the yogurt sort of captured something, the specificity of that product. So just uh, for the sake of our viewers, to give you a very brief snapshot, viewers, of the book, um, there is a kind of a framework uh, presented around this idea at the top of the book by Saskia and Mary, and they come back to it in a conclusion. And in between, they edit chapters that uh, sort of apply this thinking and observation and research to a number of cities, including uh, Kabul, Karachi, Baghdad, Bamako, uh, the border um, around between the United States and Mexico, around uh, Ciudad. And what you see in these places is a pattern of sustained insecurity uh, that may be a result from time to time of formal war, may be a result of uh, organized criminal activity in the midst of war. It may be something uh, sort of closer to asymmetric violence or complex civil violence that just goes on for a long period of time. And of course, Beirut would have been a candidate for inclusion in your survey. And I want to talk about it at Safwan's instigation a little bit later. Mm. But in thinking about what's common in these cities, um, certainly among uh, Baghdad, Kabul, I don't know Bamako as well, uh, Karachi, but I would think because of the recent French-led uh, engagement there, uh, Bamako would be a candidate. You have this sublime phrase that I had never encountered before. Maybe it's common in your fields um, of the simultaneous presence of a liberal peace and the war on terror and how uh, the attempt to kind of resolve those two uh, deployments in effect uh, uh, creates enormous harm, really, uh, and, and intensifies the violence in many instances. So, so what is it, do you think, if you want to talk about that uh, phrase, liberal peace and the war on terror, 
or other frameworks, what is it that you think are the most important commonalities among the kinds of cities that you surveyed? Um, is it their, their perpetual state of structural insecurity or is it their status as uh, sort of places of displacement for many of their countrymen and others? Is it their international characteristics? What would you single out? I think what I would single out is actually the underlying violence, which is exacerbated by external intervention. Well, not always exacerbated by external intervention, somewhat less by the liberal peace and more by the war on terror. Um, but it's what I call new wars. And it's the idea that contemporary violence is less a deep-rooted political contest and more a kind of social condition. It's kind of the military equivalent of neoliberalism, <laughs> if you like, in which there are numerous armed groups who actually benefit from violence itself rather than from winning or losing. And they benefit from violence itself, either for economic reasons, they're uh, just simple loot and pillage or kidnapping or hostage taking. We have numerous instances in Syria where agreements to halt violence in which the government is actually involved have been undermined on the government side by their militias who are making money from checkpoints, for example but also for political reasons that these wars generate uh, sectarianism. They generate extremist identities and great fears of the other that often didn't exist previously. And for both those reasons, they're terribly difficult to end and they're persistent. But what we also tried to show in the book was that they're not merely urban based and this again is Saskia's contribution, the idea that they exist in cities because cities provide global communications and financial infrastructures on which they depend. Um, and there are these external actors who could be, it could be the war on terror, which is the case on the border with Mexico, which is the case on Karachi. And what we mean by the liberal peace is areas where the international community, and this is where Beirut is so interesting, I think, <laughs> because the international community has tried to make peace. That was the Taif agreement that ended the civil war in Beirut. By making an agreement among these armed groups whose only interest is preying upon the citizens. And so it stops the balance between the armed groups, but it entrenches the position of <laughs> these guys who are a combination of warlords and ethnic or sectarian politicians. And these people have been ruling Lebanon since the end of the civil war. Um, and so while we celebrate the end of the civil war and the Taif agreement, this is typical of the liberal peace, that it is entrenched these ethnic or religious warlords, which makes a real peace very difficult and which allows the kind of underlying predatory violence to continue. And it's because they're so corrupt, their only interest is really access to the resources of the state, that when, you, when it comes to a disaster, the money's gone, or when it comes to doing something responsible, nobody's interested. Saskia, do you have something to add? to those observations? Well, I, I think that the issue, I, I totally agree with what Mary said, so I'm not going to go into that zone. But I just wanted to, to emphasize sort of a question that I think of as a kind of transversality that cities are capable of, and that's also how they connect. But in, in a way that national governments would not easily connect in that way. And and partly that transversality emerges because cities need each other, because every city is an incomplete system and they could not last if they don't have access to other cities and other types of sites. So final point very quickly, uh, I think it is also a period of decay of major cities. I think they have seen I mean, cities have existed for a very long time. They have different phases, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, my reading, whether that is New York City, whether that is all kinds of other places, there is a kind of decay 
something is not quite working. It's like dead stuff, too much dead stuff. I don't mean people, I mean institutions that are not functioning. Middle-class families have become poor, et cetera, et cetera. So that besides the question of war, these types of issues are also happening in cities that are at war. And they're also happening in New York where we supposedly don't have war. So, you know, how does that actually fit? What does it tell us about a possibility, this is my reading a bit, huh, of an emergent new period where new modalities will emerge and, you know, sort of something will be left behind that is still operative now that will cease to be of utility. That is sort of one, one issue that I'm struggling with when in my research on cities right now, that many of these cities are in decay, no matter that they might be brand new buildings. We also have a lot of empty brand new buildings. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, so that's very suggestive. And it, it, it leads me to something I was uh, thinking about as I read through uh, the chapters, which was this question of accountability or redress in environments like the one in Beirut. Uh, it seems, perhaps you wouldn't uh, agree with this, but it seems that the age of connectivity and social media since the Arab Spring has given rise to many instances of popular mobilization against failing urban governments. Um, and yet, certainly in the Arab world, a lot of these mobilizations have ended in tears or have never even gained a cabinet seat, never mind uh, you know, a full promise of reform. Now we see this again in Beirut. Uh, this was happening, of course, before the explosion. Uh, uh, but um, without a lot of success. And so I guess my question is, when you look at uh, these megalopolises that are at the heart of the portraits in your book, and you look at, at political mobilization, popular political mobilization in the age of connectivity, do you have a thesis about how it works, why it doesn't seem to work so often? I mean, obviously you can think of places in more developed parts of the world, like Central Europe, Romania, Slovakia, where popular mobilization has led to concrete political change, but not so much in these more paralyzed, insecure cities. There's plenty of mobilization in Baghdad too, but very few results. So, so what's going on there, or where does political protest fit in the portrait of cities that's emerged from your research? Actually, I think there is some change happening, both in Lebanon and Iraq with governments resigning and but before I say that I want to make a couple of points one is about the difference between 89 and the Arab Spring because I was very involved in 89 and the other is about the nature of the protests in Beirut Baghdad and I think we should include Sudan because that's very similar and very interesting even though it isn't in our book Mm -hmm. um, on 89, I've often puzzled about why it was so easy. And what I realized retrospectively was that the communist elite saw their counterparts in the West who were capitalists and thought they could exchange their political positions for material wealth. And that's exactly what they did. Yes, they so they I, allowed a change it, of regime and they became, uh, they became the new oligarchs. Right. Their hypothesis was in correct, the, as it turned out. What? <laughs> Their hypothesis was correct, as it turned out. They could do that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, this is my retrospective <laughs> hypothesis. <laughs> At the time, I thought. But, um, but um, and of course, in the Middle East, the governments of both the oligarchs and the politicians and they have so much more to lose they lose everything and so they're extremely resistant but what i think has changed is actually the nature of the protesters and that i think is really really interesting um, what you see if you follow what the protesters in iraq lebanon and sudan is they're not calling for their government to fall they're not calling, I mean, they want the government to fall, but they're not ca calling for the end of the leader. What they're calling for is a change of the system. And their analysis is quite 
acute. You know, the Baghdad slogan is in the name of religion, you're looting us. <laughs> and the same, it's this combination of corruption and sectarianism that they're all against. And the other very interesting thing about these demonstrations is that women play a hugely important role in all of them. And the women have actually developed a theory that if they're the front line, it's going to be more difficult to stop them. Mm. Added to that sort of the change in the nature of the protest, I think we're seeing a huge change in the nature of the oil prices have returned to their pre-COVID oil price, but still we're going through a process of decarbonisation, which has been incredibly important in Sudan. And one of the reasons in Sudan why the protests were able to succeed is that the government revenue shifted from oil to mercenaryism, selling off the soldiers and gold, and that sort of created an opening. So I think if we look at both sides of this, there are more possibilities. And then finally, of course, and this relates to our book, you know, I think there are opportunities at the urban level because of the kind of communities that have been constructed through these protests. Mm. If I may interject, I mean, this is fascinating there. You're running through it. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the calls have not been for the fall of the government, but rather for the fall of the system and the regime. Mm -hmm. And the question, I think it, the tough question is, how does that take place? So take Lebanon, you mentioned Taif in 1993, and that's when all the uh, various uh, groups, clans, um, you know, whatever you want to call them, came together and divided up the, uh, the country, and that has become so entrenched, you know, when, when you have Hassan Nasrallah begging Saad Hariri not to resign from government, I mean, that tells you <laughs> amazing. about how intersecting and interdependent uh, those relationships are, and the same thing is true in, in, um, in, in Sudan, um, in a different way, yeah. So how do you respond to that? Yeah. One problem is the anti-political nature of the protesters. I mean, who becomes the government? Do they create a political party? And that was the problem in Egypt. Well, and I think there's, yeah, there's some people who might argue that's uh, related to the form of mobilization that relies so heavily on social media structures, which are flat and, uh, and more ephemeral than, say, um, unions or deep-rooted political parties. But Saskia, jump in ab about this idea of political protest and the, and the cities that you've been researching. Right, well, I mean, there is protest and then there are these other modalities, you know, that we don't easily identify and recognize as playing a role, which is not necessarily a visible manifestation, but it is how people are organizing their lives. and. And that is also well, interesting. And when war enters into a city, it perhaps above all unsettles those modalities. Those are the elements that sort of will suffer seriously. Uh, and of course, the food question. But it seems to me that, that uh, what, what I sort of want to recover is the fact that cities have capabilities. And some of those capabilities will go under, under certain conditions and others will rise. So the interesting point about this example that, 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 uh, that Mary was talking about is that in the middle of really a brutal war, there is that yogurt run. You know, that is like a shorthand for all kinds of other things. That is something that a fully fledged army would not have, or the, whatever the equivalent version of that. So there is something about the city that even in a situation of war yeah. can sort of bring in these types of elements, you know, that are people elements. They don't have to do with the war. They have to do with how do I get my food, feed my children. And, and again, the space of the city is, is, is a space that inevitably 
will have that and can handle that. Uh, you know, anyhow, I mean, war is not my subject. I think uh, Mary is really the expert here on war. Cities are. So I found it extraordinarily interesting to begin to connect the war question with cities. And it is quite, actually, when you really think about it, it's quite remarkable. Oh dear, I keep losing. Oh. Yes, now, I'm not speaking now, so are you speaking? <laughs> no, I just America. lost you for a while. Yeah, I think, Mary, your, your, your connection may be a little bit unstable, but you've mostly been with us without any difficulty. I wanted to, to ask uh, another question that was suggested by a word you used, Mary, which was opportunities. And, and even the word capabilities has a, has a little bit of an implication embedded in it, which is that it might provide uh, some insight to the United Nations or to donor nations that despite the sort of structural impossibility of addressing the chronic insecurity in a place like Kabul or Beirut. Nonetheless, uh, they're there and they are seeking to be less harmful and more useful. Um, and so what is it about the mapping that you're doing that you think might have implications for the, for the allocation of international resources or presence or, or policy in the cities where you've surveyed? I think there are two issues. I mean, one is that the United Nations, our outsiders, tend to focus on states as a whole. And they, when it comes to peace agreements, they're trying to find a national political settlement. And in fact, if they were to be much more granular and multidimensional and were to think about lower levels, they might be able to change the situation on the ground. The other thing is that in the end, it's the people on the ground who make the peace, but you can find in contemporary wars are very fragmented, very decentralized, and you can find places in these contemporary wars, and that's where we bring in urban capabilities, where people have managed to resist the war. Um, a Muslim city in Serbia that managed to stay out of the Balkan Wars through the efforts of the city elite. It suffered quite a lot because it became a, a sort of refuge for Muslims in Bosnia and Croatia. Are there ways that those places could somehow be helped, uh, not drowned, uh, and could actually expand to influence other places instead of the other way around. Can I add something to that? What is, what is important about bringing in the cities is that cities are, are not national institutions on some level. They're not simply a national institution. Cities can launch initiatives. Cities can change elements in a way that a national government very often wouldn't even think about, wouldn't consider, or wouldn't be able to. So when you look at the long histories, you see that some of these cities have lasted forever across wars, across everything, whereas all kinds of national governments or you know, the equivalent have gone under. So mm. there is a kind of a capacity of survival that a city has. I mean, some cities have been wiped out, but not many actually, and they tend to come back sort of alive, even if it's half alive. And so that is also something that struck me enormously when you combine war, destruction, death, etc., poverty, miseries of all kinds, and then this urban place. Because of course, so much of the writing and the thinking and the analysis of war has focused on war and on national. Uh, institutions. And, and so we thought that that this would really be sort of to, just to add another element, you know, to the whole story of war and the militarizing of wars, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and how a city can actually survive, because 
it either goes under or it has to feed its people, so to say. And so there it is. And that's why this yogurt run, you know, became this emblematic element because the yogurt could only happen in one place by God. Enemy towns would handle the yogurt run. And that tells you something about people and how they think about war. Most books about war that I'm aware of, I'm not an expert on it, but don't deal with those aspects, you know? And you, I try to think of older histories of cities where that is not mentioned, all kinds of, you know, where all that is mentioned is who won, how they destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. And so in that sense, also it's an invitation to recognize how people under the worst possible conditions can actually find a little peace, find a connection, et cetera, et cetera. It's so, uh, no, that's great. So Saskia, to stay with you as we oh, wrap dear. up. Oh dear, I can't hear you. You can't hear me or you can't hear Saskia? Um, okay, just down here. Yeah, Saskia, um, sorry. Um, as we wrap up our part of the conversation, I wanted to try to ask each, each of you a little bit about uh, your sort of forward-looking uh, research uh, agenda w around cities um, and what you think uh, it would be interesting to learn in a next generation of study. And, and Saskia, I think you set the table for this by talking about your sense of cities in decay. And uh, with without asking you to only talk about that, could you say more about what you mean or why, what you would measure to demonstrate the decay that you're intrigued by? Well, there are sort of two vectors in play here. One, you could just go back across time, across epochs, across, and there are these cities, you know, and they're still with us. <laughs> they may have decayed, they may have changed, but you stand back and you say, wow, how is that possible? That's the only thing that has survived all the terrible things that have happened, you know, I mean, you just think about the West. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that we humans, you know, we're sort of stuck with each other a bit. Uh, of course, there are a few solo heroes, you know, but, but the truth of the matter is that we are really mutually dependent. We do not, we are not autonomous, right? We are not that kind of, can, can you hear me or? Yes. Oh, okay, fine. And so to me, it is also in, in that sense, this question of the city as opposed to the country, as opposed to the national huh, space. Which is a new phenomenon, Saskia, okay. right? Which is a new phenomenon because, you know, listening to you talk about the cities versus the nation. I mean, if you, if you look through an older history, wars were, were, were you know, was between cities and empires, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so, yes, we have had cities forever. I mean, very, very, we can't even trace exactly when that, those first cities emerged, you know, uh, in Asia. But, but at the same time, uh, I think what is important is that no city can survive on its own. It would be very difficult. I mean, they can, of course, under certain very extreme conditions, they, they, they can make it work. But we really need, cities need each other. They need other formations types of formations, they need, you know, certain, they need food, they need this, they need that. And so that tells you that the city is forever a, a, a condition that needs to be on alert. It can't just go take a nap, you know, it has to deal with all kinds of things. And I think that is also very interesting. Absolutely fascinating. And of course, all of us who have uh, lived through New York's uh, year or nine months uh, can testify to um, the sudden arbitrary changes, of course, that a city can, can track just by its nature, by the fact that so many people and so many connections are packed into the same geography. But um, all right, well, we're, we're a little past uh, 20 to the hour. And uh, Mary, I hope that you're, uh, you're fully back with us, but um, why don't I, uh, uh, hand off now to Sapwan to broaden the conversation with questions from the audience. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating conversation, and I'm sure we can spend a lot more time on it. There have been many questions that have come through the uh, Q and A function, so I'll try to get to a handful of them at least. 
Um, there's a question from Susanna Chiarotti um, to you, Saskia. Uh, she asks, this decaying tendency, could it be applied to Latin American cities also? So, you know, there's an interest in sort of, you know, the book and what we've been discussing today tends to be focused on um, the Middle East, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, this part of the world. What do you have to say about Latin American cities? And, you know, especially given you were born in Argentina and you have a lot of affinity in Latin America. Yeah, no, I think that, that, um, that the cities in Latin America, I, I would say, are not doing very well. This is not a good period. You have elites that have become more and more powerful and more and more indifferent. They know that they can not care about the poverty in their cities. And so it actually is not a brilliant period, as the Brits might say. You know, they love the term brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. It really is a very problematic period. Now, the, the question for me then also is just to, I, I want to do this very quickly. Uh, when you look at these extraordinarily long histories of many cities, or at least several cities, uh, enormous decay, death, violence, etc. And then poof, there <laughs> the city re-emerges, you know. And I have that sense also now that even though there are many very negative conditions in play in many cities, inequality has grown enormously, homelessness has grown, we are poisoning, you know, we don't have good quality water, etc. etc. At the same time, if you look at the long histories of cities, you see that they all have had terrible moments where you would, well, the major cities have had terrible moments. And you would say they're, they're finished. They're not. They, they simply, you get the sense that it is very difficult to eliminate a city. Hmm. You know? it, it, it's sort of, there's a kind of irony hanging in that for me, you know, that how difficult it is to destroy a city. Look at how the Germans bombed the hell out of Paris, they, the, the, and the Americans you know, bombed the hell out of some of the German cities. Dresden, of course, the core example. And they come back. Once a city has installed itself, it's very difficult for that city to disappear. And that to me is, oh ma'am, you know, it's sort of, it's an invitation to think about what is it, is it us, the people? Is it our fragilities? Is it that we ultimately need each other? We need these, you know, conglomerations of different types of humans, different capabilities. I mean, that's the other issue we haven't talked about is that a city needs an extraordinary range of specific abilities. So in that sense, we need each other, you know, mm. inside the city. Saskia, that's fascinating. Again, you know, I mean, to bring it back to this region and uh, where nations are a really new phenomenon, right? And uh, people still today, the 21st century, identify with the city that their ancestry is from. They identify with the city that they came from. Uh, you know, you're, you're Nabulsi as much as you are Palestinian. You are Aleppo. Uh, perhaps even more than you are uh, Syrian. Uh, let's go to another question, and maybe we'll turn this one to, um, to Mary. Uh, it's from uh, Suda Mohan, uh, who asks, have both the oligarchs and Democrats failed cities? Will there be any resurgence of cities um, in the foreseeable future. But I think the first part of that question is quite interesting, you know, I mean. I, I think it is. And I think, uh, while I wouldn't want to answer it as a universal, I think it has been the spread of neoliberalism, which the Democrats took up. Oh, yeah. Ah. What a pity. Mary, uh, we cannot hear you. So maybe I'll come back to you with that. And maybe if you switch the video off, your connection might become better. Yeah, municipal levels, but also yeah. introduce this contracting out culture. Uh, and both of those things, I think, cities. But the quest second part of the question, can cities bounce back? I guess I do, I mean, as I studied the worst 
places on earth. What amazes me is the way cities do. I mean, it amazes me that in Syria in the last, there have been something like 400 local agreements. A lot of these were just surrenders. A lot of these were deals by armed groups, but many were made by citizens in order to provide services to their citizens. So, and we see the same huge number, we see it in South Sudan, we see it in Somalia, these are the places I study. We see these numerous agreements being made. And I think we are gonna see something changing as a consequence of the current COVID-19 pandemic. And I think in two ways, I really do think this marks the end of neoliberalism. States suddenly have been forced to spend. They're forced to recognize their responsibility to citizens. And that will make a difference. But the other thing is that if you look at where COVID-19 has been successfully addressed, it's always been at the level of community and at the level of cities. And so I think I actually feel a little bit, I mean, I agree with, I always agree with Saskia and I've learned such a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, let's wait until Mary comes back on. But uh, what, Mary, what Mary did not say is that where COVID has been contained best has also been- In, in Marseille. Yeah. Yeah, and in countries, oh gosh, I've lost you again. My women. Yes, there's a rise in infections in France. Right, right. Um, Hilary Wainwright asks about uh, the urban capabilities, and uh, this, I think, you know, is, is more for Saskia. Does your research into the nature of urban capabilities reveal any commonalities as to the nature uh, of these capabilities? How far? Um, are these capabilities the result of work by organized citizens and civil society as distinct from established institutions? Uh, are they in that sense emergent, containing innovation and therefore a source of the new, um, well, yes, you get, you get the point, the rest yeah. of it <laughs> Altogether. Well, I think some of the questions are the answers. Some of the questions, you know, in what you just described are the answers actually right. to the matter. No, but it is really interesting. I mean, cities are some of the oldest modes in we hum in, in, through which we humans have come about, have existed. Uh, and you certainly come from an area that is very rich <laughs> in all kinds of long, long histories of cities. Now, it, on the one, I mean, the self-evident elements are that we need each other to have food, we need each other to protect ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, right? As, as you know, in the complex cities, all kinds of other elements come in play, which have to do with a very different type of need, but that needs that we also have, which is to actually not just benefit from the work of each other, you know, to survive, but actually learn, find out, disagree. You know, it's sort of, I think that must have been part of what helped our brains develop a bit, you know, that people disagreed, that they said, no, we don't do it that way. So you, you can sort of imagine scenarios of or older epochs, right, of many long times of, of originating, stories of origin, as we call them, right, where you can imagine that trying to sort out what to do, what not to do, etc., was in itself a task that gave intelligence, that brought about a bit of intelligence, if you want, and that people really needed each other. I mean, this notion, we don't realize in our current sort of situation, we tend to take it all for granted. The notion that I need other people, yeah, okay, I need the cleaner, I need the dentist, you know, but, but not that larger space within which we function, where we really need a diversity of people. We need people whom we disagree with, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And that is actually, when you think about it, a remarkable part of our human conditions. We human as isolates are really not very interesting. We humans as being part of connective tissues, we are very good at that. And we can also have wars and disagreements. But that, that to me is extraordinarily interesting. And that's a marriage of city and us humans who are, you know, we need each other. So 
there's something, and, and that is why this is not going away. You know, empires have fallen, modes of, you know, political regimes have fallen, but by God, the cities are there. And mm. you come from a part of the world where you have very deep histories. I mean, extraordinary histories. Very. Oh. There's hope in what you're saying also, because some cities have been destroyed um, and uh, perhaps they will reemerge. I, I'm sorry, Saskia, you wanted to ask Mary something. No, I just wanted to call her to make sure that she... Mary, you need to unmute. We can't hear her. Mary, Mary, you need to unmute. I can't unmute her. Okay, there we go. There we go. I think so. There is okay, let's go to the next question. But Mary, if you can hear Urban me. Urban capabilities aren't actually organized civil societies. In some cases they are. The people of Aleppo was a group of people who organized themselves. But they're actually sort of the mutual needs of the city, which is what um, Saskia is talking about. But those mutual needs can be built on. They can be transformed and used in ways, but they can be built on um, in ways to preserve the sort of cosmopolitan civic character of the city. And it's kind of no, no, interesting that those places that have experimented, you know, Bogota, we talk about in the book, the civic, the notion of civic peace is quite a popular notion. Um, at the level of the city. Yeah. And maybe we should be thinking about civic peace rather than liberal peace. Yes, I mm. agree with that. Mm. Um, so I want to use that, Mary, and turn a question to our moderator, Steve, if you don't mind. Uh, what do you think of this notion? I'm not sure that I fully understand it, but the idea of civic peace as opposed to liberal peace. Well, I think the yogurt run is a form of example of it, uh, and it's quite common in these perpetually insecure cities for uh, informal groups to negotiate um, calm in their area. Uh, they may negotiate as formally as a as a one pager agreement about who can go where when and and uh, how to prevent escalations of violence. Um, they, uh, you know, they're often, I, I encounter having, just thinking very quickly about such civic pieces that I've encountered in places like Kabul or Karachi to name two cities. I think they're most durable and effective where there is a, a communal aspect to the conflict mm -hmm. that requires uh, communal negotiation. So whether that is on the basis of faith or uh, language or ethnic identity, um, you know, groups that are, uh, whose leaders may be cynically uh, engaged in violence to enrich themselves in the way that Saskia and Mary talked about at the very top of our discussion. They're leaving behind communities that are quite capable of negotiating their own common sense standstill agreements uh, across neighborhood lines. Uh, often in, the book used this phrase I hadn't encountered it's a mouthful, but enclavization of cities. Yes. And that is a result of perpetual insecurity. You get groups that huddle together for their own protection. Once they do that, they can negotiate civic peace uh, quite efficiently because they are geographically whole and they can talk to the folks next door who's, you know, who they may be formally in conflict with because of the cynical opportunism of their leaders, but at a neighborhood level, they can find sustained pauses and standstills. Um, oh, it, so I'm, sure there's, yeah, I'm sure there are other versions of that. But I'm, Somehow I'm, I'm now reminded when I was growing up in Buenos Aires, there was this horrible time uh, when the, the, um, the military, you know, took live people who were contestatories and just took a plane and dropped them in the ocean, you know, killed them, basically, mothers, etc. And that, that is something we have not talked about. It's also, you know, the negative elements, how a concentration of people in a city can also become the subject of extraordinary uh, abuse huh, of those people. And, and in, in Buenos Aires, it was very extreme. It, it was absolutely horrifying, you know. And um, 
and I remember it, just if I can take a minute, I remember the first time I felt a bomb explode. We were living in the city and I was about seven years old and I felt, and it was right beneath where we were, and I felt it first inside my body and then the sound. Has any of you had that experience? It was quite extraordinary that first your body and then, I mean, a question of fractions of seconds. But that period of Argentina was really severely bad. And the city, of course, revived afterwards, etc., etc. That is also a capability that cities have. I mean, there are very few cities that have disappeared from the landscape. If you had it there, you know, 5,000 years ago, <laughs> chances are it's still there, you know, no matter the ups and downs. Mm. Mary, you want to uh, bring in some final points? It is your... The awful thing is that uh, my internet, I don't know why it's so bad. So I don't know if you can hear me. I, we hear I you. could hardly hear, hear. We hear you. Yes, yes. But I just wanted to say to Steve about the local agreements that I think civic is when people are against communal identifications. I mean, I first came across the term in Bosnia during the war when they described the civic parties as the non-ethnic parties. Mm. And it's when citizens come together not to benefit a particular community, but to try to benefit the whole local area that I would call it a civic piece. And um, I think in that women have always played a very, very important role uh, crossing ethnicities and working together. Yeah. Um, you've that I've come across at local areas and plenty of deals among armed groups. So I'm not being positive necessarily about all local agreements, but I'm saying where there are active citizens, usually teachers and doctors and engineers, who really want to make the public services work for people. That's when local agreements um, can represent a sort of civic peace. And I think what I suppose if we were gonna build on urban capabilities, it was how could urban capabilities produce civic peace? And of course, in all Saskia's work, you know, she starts with city-states and how the constitutional order leaps to the nation-state. <laughs> and I guess... ...it might leap to regional or international institutions too. Right. And that idea of civil peace, actually, I mean, to go back to where I, at least I opened up, uh, in Beirut, uh, this is what is happening. I mean, you know, got the war with the with the lead, with the leaders and amongst the leaders, but you've got civic peace that keeps things flowing um, day to day, and um, we see that in in any number of places around the world. Um, you know, something you said, Saskia. So we're going over time a little bit, but I can't help myself from from so. When we think about cities in today, in the context of today's pandemic crisis, and you talked about Buenos Aires, and you talked about sort of abuse and, and other things, negative things that can happen in cities, you think of um, cities like Delhi or Mumbai, where you have huge slums, or you think of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Um, isn't that another form of war? Um, yeah. I am a great critic and I find, I must tell you, I don't mean to offend here, but I find India one of the worst examples, partly because they have an extraordinarily intelligent, well-educated, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the population. They have, they just have brilliant people of all kinds. And the way the poor are treated in India I find one of the most objectionable countries. I find myself, I don't know if I should even say this, but I find myself objecting more to India than say to China, you know? 
I don't know what yeah. you all think. You don't have to tell me. But I really find, and India, I think the caste system must be part of the functionality. You know, it's like a natural. You know, right. these rich, I mean, 20, 30% were really rich and they're fine and they're intelligent and they're wonderful and zero interest in the poor. A country yeah. that has so much poverty, you know, I mean, a misery that is terrible. So I, I don't know, that is one for me, a very problematic country. But this and then you talk about expulsion, if, uh, if I remember correctly, you yeah. talk about um, India. I mean, you know, you've got a country of 1.3 billion people where the 200 wealthiest families, uh, their combined wealth is roughly one third of the country's GDP. You've got a problem, you've got a huge problem. <laughs> Uh, this has been absolutely fascinating, um, and it's you know really a testament to how global um, the the how globally connected we have become. Uh, perhaps, uh, especially during this Corona crisis, Mary joining us from Provence, and I'm sorry for the uh, uh, spotty internet connection that you have, uh, but thank you for being a trooper and hanging in there. And Saskia in London and Steve on the shores of Pennsylvania, I think, or New Jersey. Well, I can't hear you. Uh, New Jersey. New Jersey, okay. A garden spot, garden spot. This sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and myself in Amman and with a global audience from all over the world. Um, can't thank you enough, really, uh, for this brilliant conversation. Can't thank you enough, Mary and Saskia, um, for the book. Um, you know, both uh, Steve and I independently read uh, through parts of it, at least uh, in preparation for today. And I can't wait to, um, you know, continue uh, reading it. And uh, to our friends at the Columbia University Press, uh, to Eric Schwartz and Meredith Howard in particular, uh, a big shout out and to the uh, Committee on Global Thought, uh, to LSE and all of our partners. Um, thank you so very much. Be well and stay safe. Bye.